What's up, fisher people? I hope you're having a great fall transition fishing season so far. And if you're not, maybe you should give us a call and you should come up to Sikakawea and we'll take you out. Could be a good time. Anyway, there's a running joke between me, my dad, and my brother from this trip we had to South Dakota a few years ago. And we were fishing a spot with an earshot of two other boats that were clearly in a group together and they were starting to crisscross each other. And one yells to the other, I can mark him, I just can't catch him. Of course, that's an issue that we all deal with from time to time, trying to get the fish to actually bite, right? But there is a little bit of an art and science to figuring out which fish may or may not be more active than other fish and where you should try to fish for them to have a better chance at a higher catch rate. So it's important to know that at any given time, there's a lot of different fish in different depths in different locations doing different things. Some are feeding and active and some are just taking a chill and resting. So just because you found marks doesn't mean you found the fish. Like you found some fish, but they might not be interested. And you can always get, you know, one out of 30 or 40 or 50 inactive fish to bite potentially just by being super stubborn with them and putting live bait in their face all day long or trying to get a reaction strike from something like a jigging wrap or a crankbait. But that pales in comparison to finding the active fish where you might be able to get one out of three or one out of two or almost all of them to bite when things are really good. So we're going to try to break down this concept of active fish based on both depth as well as like geographical location, like different spots and different areas to try to help you figure out you know, if, if you're not getting bites on the spot that you're on where you're marking fish, perhaps there's some better place that has some different fish that are more likely to bite. Let's take a situation here from Lake Sakakawea this year, um, late spring, early summer. It was like a, call it the first week of June. Um, most of the fish that we were catching, the active fish that we were finding, were very, very shallow, especially if the wind was blowing into spots. But even if it wasn't, they're up there because the water is just starting to warm and the shallow surface water is warming faster than the deep water. And that's where a lot of the bait fish are going to boost up their metabolisms. So we were finding fish anywhere from one or two to 10, maybe 12 feet of water at that point. Mostly pitching jigs, sometimes trolling over the fish, depending on how finicky they were with live bait. At the same time though, you could mark a lot of fish in 15 to 20 to 22 feet of water. And I, I remember driving by a lot of different boats during this time period or talking to people at the fish cleaning station afterwards saying, I, I could mark fish all over the place in 20 feet of water, but we only got one fish today or two fish today. Well, they were finding the inactive fish that were in their resting locations. They were not feeding down there. Um, no matter what they did or what they put down there, they were never going to catch as many fish as they would have if they would have just pitched something up shallow like a jig or a crankbait. It comes to these late spring, early summer situations and you're fishing that shallow water, things are very, very wind dependent. So when you're looking for a spot, you're almost always looking for places where the wind is pushing into the structure, the shoreline, the point, whatever it is you're looking at and blowing the bait fish in there and blowing the food chain in there, stirring up the water a little bit to provide some cover for the walleyes to hunt and to feed. Now there will be some days where it might be fairly calm and you'll still find fish in some of those spots and kind of what you're looking for at that point in time is basically where you found them the previous day. Where was the wind blowing yesterday? They might still be hanging around those locations because maybe the bait hasn't moved a whole lot yet. It gets a little tougher when there's no active wind blowing into these spots, but it can still be done and they're still going to be up shallow that time of year typically and they're still going to be more active when they are shallow. And to try to help illustrate this point, I put together this neat little graphic all by myself that kind of depicts um, where you would find the active fish up shallow near the bait and then where you're finding the inactive fish further down deeper. There's no bait down there, 
The walleyes are just chilling out in the depth they found comfortable at that time to rest. End of story period. You might get lucky and catch one or two, but you're not going to catch very many down there at this time of year. Now, when you get more into the summer period, you're going to find more active fish in that depth of 20 to 25 feet of water 15 even you know kind of depends on the day and how far into the season you are but there's going to be bait fish down there now there's going to be walleyes chasing bait in those deeper depths and they're going to become more productive locations so a lot of people do a lot of their walleye fishing kind of in that summer period anyway so they're very used to you know 18 to 22 to 25 feet of water that's kind of their walleye fishing depth and if they're not catching them down there then walleye fishing isn't good you know from their perspective but they're probably just in the wrong spots and in the wrong depths um, that said even in the summertime and even in the, the fall transition in the fall period like all throughout the year there's a chance you're gonna get walleyes up shallow near shorelines and points and structure like that if the wind is blowing if you get wind blowing into a spot especially for a long period of time consistently for a day or two or more three or four especially, and in the early morning time is even better, or the evening time, you will get fish coming up onto those shallow shoreline structures to feed on fish, even if a lot of them are down deep. So anytime that you can find walleyes in less than 10 feet, if you can get a bait in front of their face, you've got a pretty good chance of catching them. You're not gonna find as many of them there in the later seasons of the year as you would early, early on, but if you do find them, they're probably gonna be very active. Now, one of the trickier time periods is like right now, as I'm talking, as I'm filming this video, which is the fall transition period. So once the, the water temperatures have reached kind of their summer peak, and then you start to first get some cold weather and the temps crash pretty hard. And then in this case, we also had a massive, massive cold front on top of it. Like we're talking freeze warnings overnight kind of stuff. So the water temperature dropped from 78 to 65 pretty quickly. And then we had two nights in a row freezing and the fish did not like that unstable environment of the shallower part of the water column. And they went super, super, super deep. I mean, we're talking out to 50 and 60 feet and there's probably some walleyes even deeper than that. They're just harder to see and harder to graph. So at this point in time, the situation was a little more complicated as you can see from this graphic here. So again, you might still have the odd fish up there in three, four, five feet of water when the wind's blowing into a shoreline early in the morning, something like that. But the bulk of the fish were down in 35 plus, 35 to 55 foot that were feeding. That said, we were still marking a lot of fish in 25 feet of water, in 28 feet of water, maybe 30 feet of water. And it was starting to get very frustrating to not get those fish to bite. And then I started thinking, you know, again, if they're not active, you gotta find where the active fish are. And I'm thinking, well, okay, so there's some, I'm hearing of some fish being caught in 50 feet of water. And I know from past experience that there's fish that will be caught in 50 feet of water this time of year. But I'm seeing so many of them in 25, and you would think the shallower fish are more likely to bite. Right? Wrong. Like in this case, it was just dead wrong because the bait wasn't there. So when I started looking closer at the graph, all these fish that I'm seeing in 25 feet, they're just chilling, they're just resting, there is no bait there. All of the bait was down in 35 plus. So when a walleye is in its resting state it's just finding a depth that it likes that's comfortable for it to chill out hang out and rest recuperate when it wants to go feed then it's either going to go shallower or deeper wherever it has to go to find the bait even if it's not its ideal environment or temperature of water or oxygen levels it's trying to find fish and that's where the bait was it was very 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 deep and as you can see by this screenshot here of my graph that's a great example of a big cloud of bait with a fish mark underneath it and that's an active fish if you see a fish mark right beneath or in a bait cloud you got a really good chance of catching that fish I don't care what the depth is they're there to feed that's a good scenario for you that's something you want to look for talked before on the fishing reports and other situations you know remember when you're fishing this deep have to keep in mind the concept of barotrauma, which is the deeper you go, the more pressure there is from the water squeezing down on fish. And fish 
Some fish can adapt to being pulled through different pressures well and some can't. A walleye is an example of a fish that can't very well. So if you catch a fish in 50 feet of water and you pull it up really quickly, it's not going to adapt kind of the way a scuba diver gets the bends, that kind of thing, right? Um, the pressure change is going to damage that fish and probably kill it. So when you're fishing that deep, you have to have a plan of, I'm out here because I want to catch and keep fish. And if you get to the point where you're done keeping fish, you need to move off that spot. You need to try to find some shallower fish. You may not be able to find them, but even if in your mind you're releasing the fish and they may even look okay, 80 to 90% of those fish die out of depths like that. They're just not going to survive. So you're, you're doing more harm than good by letting them go at that point. Not the topic of this video, but when we talk about deep water fishing, I always like to throw that in because it's a very important thing to remember um, to take care of our resource and to take care of our fish and only to take what you need. So location. Um, location is a little tougher to, to determine active fish versus depth in my view partly because it's easier to track you know de depending on the seasonality what depths they might be in because of what the water temperature would be down there but location wise um, mostly what you're looking for is situations where again you find bait on that location sometimes you pull up to a point and you see bait and sometimes you pull up to a point and you don't if there's not bait there it's less likely those fish are going to be active and then you're looking at other things, again, like wind. Wind is still a huge thing. Not maybe as much when you're in 50 feet of water, but it's still good to have some. Um, but if, if you got wind crashing into the North Shore for three days, fishing the South Shore is probably not going to be very productive. If you do mark fish, they might not be very active. Um, and then beyond that, honestly, the trick uh, is trial and error. So if you pull up to a point and you see a bunch of fish, or you pull up to a hump, a deep water hump, a sunken island, something like that, and you fish it for 10, 15, 20 minutes and you're just not getting bit, move on. Some fish just aren't feeding at that time. That's not their feeding window. Um, maybe they're migrating fish. Maybe they're on the move. Um, maybe they're, they're just resting. Maybe they just ate. Maybe they just ate a bunch and they're full. Um, you can't make a fish bite that's very, very negative. Again, once in a while, you might get one, you might get two with reaction strike or dangling some live bait in their face for a long time, but your odds are much better if you just keep moving and find active fish. And you don't know if they're active, in this case, until you throw in there. And if, if you get on the right fish, you'll know it because the activity will be a lot better. They'll bite very quick. Oftentimes, if you're on the right spot, you'll get bit within seconds of fishing the spot or on your first or second cast you're fishing into a shoreline or something like that. I know it gets frustrating that you're like, well, I, I marked the fish, I found them, but once you catch them, there will be more. <laughs> there will be more fish on other spots. You've got to find the ones that are willing to eat. you got to stay on the move if you want to be successful. So hopefully that video was helpful. I feel like it's a timely topic as of right now because especially the depth Part of things is a very big deal as we're fishing Lake Sakakawea right now and determining where you're going to have your best luck at catching which fish and you can apply that to other lakes around the area too. I'm, depth is all relative so when we're talking about specific numbers that might not apply to whatever lake you're fishing but the concept would be the same if you want more help beyond that or if you don't have a boat you don't want to fish yourself feel free to give us a call we'll take you out and we'd love to see you on Lake Sakakawea sometime soon.